It's easy to take for granted the vast quantities of astronomical information that we have access to. For example, if you want to learn about your favorite star, all you have to do is type the name of the star into a search engine, hit enter, and click on a link to a web page. There you will find some table conveniently giving you the properties of the star, including its location on the sky, radial velocity, distance, mass, radius, luminosity, temperature, chemical composition, rotation period, and age. But how do astronomers know all of these attributes of the star? Indeed, how can they know these things? After all, nobody has ever actually gone to a star and made the required measurements. Did they make the numbers up, possibly to get funding? No, of course they didn't. Even though we can't go to the star, the star sends us a coded message containing everything that we could ever want to know about it. That coded message is buried within the light that we receive from the star. When it comes to astronomy, light is the single most important thing in the universe. Our telescopes collect and analyze light that was emitted long ago and that has traveled across vast distances of space to reach us. This light contains a treasure trove of information about the universe. By analyzing it, we can learn everything that we could ever want to know about the object that emitted it and the properties of the gas and dust that fills the space between us and the object. Most of the evidence for the Big Bang Theory comes from astronomy and therefore involves light in some form or another. For example, we know that the universe is expanding because of the effect of the expansion on the light emitted by distant galaxies. We know that the universe used to be very hot, dense, and uniform because of observations that we have made of the cosmic microwave background, which is just a uniform background of light that fills all of the universe. The detailed properties of the cosmic microwave background tell us everything that we could ever want to know about the universe. So, if we want to truly understand the evidence for the Big Bang Theory, we have to develop a solid understanding of the behavior of light. We need to know how light is generated, how it propagates through space, and how it interacts with matter. In this video, we will begin our discussion of the nature of light that will be needed to understand the Big Bang Theory. We will begin with the question, what is light? Well, in our everyday experience, light is the thing that lets us see things. If we want to see the objects in a room, we turn a light bulb on. The light bulb emits light that bounces off the objects in the room and enters our eyes, allowing us to see the objects. But what exactly is it that the light bulb emits that bounces off the objects in the room and enters your eye? To make progress in answering this question, we need to ask another question. Is light a wave or a particle phenomenon? That is, is the light bulb emitting waves or particles? As it turns out, the thing that the light bulb is emitting has both wave and particle properties, a situation referred to as the wave-particle duality of light. A complete wave theory of light was developed in the mid-1800s, and a particle theory of light was developed in the early 1900s. By the 1940s, the theory of quantum electrodynamics consistently modeled light as both a wave and a particle. Now we will begin to develop the wave theory of light. In the classical theory of light developed in the mid-1800s, light was modeled as an electromagnetic wave, that is, as a periodic disturbance in the electromagnetic field. To understand what this means, we need to learn some basic concepts about electromagnetism. One of the fundamental properties of every particle in the universe is electric charge. It is an intrinsic property like mass, in the sense that all particles of the same type have the same electric charge. Charge can be positive or negative. For example, electrons are negatively charged particles and protons are positively charged particles. Charged particles exert forces on other charged particles and the result of these forces is that opposite charges attract and like charges repel. For example, if particle A is positively charged and particle B is negatively charged, then A exerts a force on B that points towards A and B exerts a force on A that points towards B. But if A and B are both positively charged, or both negatively charged, then A exerts a force on B that points away from A, and B exerts a force on A that points away from B. We can explain these forces between charged particles by introducing an entity called the electric field. At every point in space, the electric field has a magnitude and a direction. We can visualize the electric field by drawing green arrows at representative points in space whose direction is the same as the direction of the field and whose length is proportional to the magnitude of the field. Charged particles create an electric field in the space surrounding them. 
positively charged particles create an electric field that points directly away from them, while negatively charged particles create an electric field that points directly towards them. Electric fields exert forces on charged particles. The force is in the same direction as the field if the particle is positively charged, and is in the opposite direction if the particle is negatively charged. The rules that we have given so far are sufficient to understand why like charges repel and opposite charges attract. For example, suppose that particles A and B are both positively charged. Particle A creates an electric field that points directly away from A. Hence, the electric field of A at B points directly away from A. Since B is positively charged, the electric field of A exerts a force on B in the same direction as the field which is directly away from A. In addition to electric fields, there are magnetic fields. We are familiar with magnetic fields as they keep magnets attached to refrigerators and they make compass needles point north. Like electric fields, magnetic fields have a magnitude and a direction at every point in space. We can visualize the magnetic field by drawing blue arrows at representative points in space whose direction is the same as the direction of the field and whose length is proportional to the magnitude of the field. Magnetic fields are generated by moving electric charges. Unlike electric fields, which can begin and end on charges, magnetic fields can only circle around the direction that the charge is moving. Magnetic fields exert forces on moving electric charges. The force is perpendicular to the direction of both the magnetic field and the direction that the charge is moving. We can summarize the rules that govern the interaction of charged particles in the electromagnetic field as follows. Electric fields are generated by and exert forces on electric charges, and magnetic fields are generated by and exert forces on moving electric charges. In the 1800s it was discovered that there was another way to create electric and magnetic fields that was required to make the laws of physics that govern electromagnetic fields mathematically consistent. It turns out that changing electric fields can generate changing magnetic fields and vice versa. Suppose that the magnitude of the electric field at some point in space is changing with time. This will create a magnetic field that circles around the direction of the electric field. Similarly, if the strength of the magnetic field at a point in space is changing with time, then an electric field will be generated that loops around the magnetic field direction. There is an important consequence of the fact that changing electric fields can create magnetic fields and vice versa. It turns out that this allows disturbances in the electromagnetic field to propagate through space at the speed of light. These disturbances, which take the form of electromagnetic waves, can be identified with light. To see how electromagnetic waves travel through space, imagine that both the electric and magnetic fields in some region of space are zero. Then, for some reason, the magnitude of the electric field at some point in this space suddenly increases. Since the magnitude of the electric field is changing with time, it generates a magnetic field that loops around it. The magnitude of this magnetic field is itself changing with time, and thus generates an electric field. This changing electric field generates a changing magnetic field, which generates a changing electric field ad infinitum. The net result is that a disturbance in the electromagnetic field propagates away from the region where the field first changed with time. At a sufficiently far distance, the disturbance will take the form of an electromagnetic wave. In an electromagnetic wave, the electric field oscillates in a direction perpendicular to the direction that the magnetic field oscillates, and the wave moves in a direction perpendicular to both the direction of the electric field and the direction of the magnetic field. Like all waves, electromagnetic waves have certain properties. These include wavelength, frequency, speed, direction, period, amplitude, and polarization. Wavelength is the distance between two adjacent crests of the wave. Frequency is the number of oscillations that the electric field makes per unit time at a fixed point in space. Period is the time it takes the electric field to make a complete oscillation at a fixed point in space. Speed and direction refer to the speed and direction of motion of a crest on the wave. Amplitude refers to the maximum magnitude of the electric field during an oscillation. Polarization refers to the direction that the electric field oscillates in. The electric field is able to oscillate in any direction perpendicular to the direction of motion. If the electric field oscillates in an up-down direction, the electromagnetic wave is called plane polarized. The electric field could also move in a circle, in which case we have circularly polarized light. Actually, in the most general case, the electric field vector traces out an ellipse, and we say that we have elliptically polarized light. So, light can be modeled as an electromagnetic wave, but we can only see electromagnetic waves with wavelengths between 380 and 750 nanometers. 
Each color of the rainbow corresponds to an electromagnetic wave with a particular wavelength. From longest to shortest wavelength, the colors are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. Of course, there are electromagnetic waves with wavelengths longer than 750 nanometers and shorter than 380 nanometers, even though we can't see them. We classify these invisible electromagnetic waves into one of six categories, depending on wavelength. The light that we can see is placed in its own category, called visible light. From longest to shortest wavelength, the categories of the electromagnetic spectrum are radio, microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma ray. We have learned how electromagnetic waves propagate through space, but how are they generated in the first place? That is what we will learn in the next video.